Um, thanks very much, uh, Merlit, uh, to you and all the organizers for inviting me to this fantastic event. Um, we've got a, such a great lineup that I am uh, already looking forward to all the other uh, sessions and interactions. Uh, and as you said, uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about trust in, in human AI, human robot interactions, uh, since it's become uh, obviously a very important uh, topic in the last couple of years, just reflected among many other uh, things um, also by sort of, for example, the fact that the uh, uh, EU has um, put out these guidelines on trustworthy um, AI. And uh, in the field, I think this has put many researchers um, in thinking about uh, the question of like, how can you conceptualize trust? Um, what would trust actually be? Um, is there such a thing uh, between humans and technology? Uh, but I'd like to start uh, by giving a uh, sort of short overview of my understanding of what uh, of what AI is and where it currently stands and how it relates to neuroscience um, and robotics, uh, uh, especially in the space of um, brain computer interfaces, because that's something I'm, I'm actively working on here, University of Freiburg. And um, the way I like to describe it is that we are experiencing a uh, very interesting uh, kind of technological um, superconvergence uh, in which we have uh, technology that's been uh, devel in development for many, many years now uh, reaching a stage of maturity uh, that allows to build uh, a whole new generation of, um, of very interesting uh, interactive uh, intelligent systems. Uh, and the core underlying technologies that obviously all of you have heard about and know a little bit about is on the one hand our ability uh, to aggregate, collect, uh, curate uh, and make use of uh, vast amounts of, of data, uh, sort of big data aspect. Um, and a lot of these data nowadays come from sophisticated uh, microsensors uh, in devices, in the environment uh, and obviously, of course, also in, uh, in advanced um, robots and robotic systems. Uh, but uh, it wouldn't be uh, if it wasn't for uh, our advanced understandings and deployment of um, also sophisticated algorithms and machine learning approaches uh, to analyzing these data uh, that we uh, can make use of these um, technologies in very sophisticated ways now. And the core technology here is obviously um, artificial neural networks, um, often sort of uh, subsumed under the uh, moniker of deep learning. But what is actually meant uh, uh, when people talk about this is that we use um, a specific kind um, of um, architecture, software architecture called artificial neural networks um, for deep learning. And I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, uh, that so that everyone's on the same page and we know what we're talking about. So. Obviously, an artificial neural network was somehow um, inspired um, by the brain. So in the 1950s, when, when these systems, uh, these uh, algorithms were first conceived, uh, there was a lot of interest um, in neuroscience, neurology, um, in understanding uh, connections in the brain. The general idea of plasticity was already, uh, was already around. And um, there was a thing called the neuron doctrine in which uh, neuroscience has made um, the neuron the central tenet of the way the, uh, the brain is organized um, as a processing unit. And the basic idea is that you have um, some kind of elements, in the brain you would call the neurons, um, you could also simulate them uh, artificially in computer programs. Uh, and these elements have connections and that's pretty much um, all there is. Um, and you can see here, uh, in this uh, in this figure that then you can arrange these elements in such a way that, for example, all these different elements uh, are connected to each other. Uh, and in the brain, um, this input layer uh, would be uh, neurons, for example, that have some, some kind of perceptual role. So um, uh, cells in the retina or, or uh, perceptually um, oriented uh, neurons in the brain, they receive some kind of perceptual input. Uh, it could be light, chemical signals, uh, bioelectric signals. Uh, and they uh, do something with the signal. They send the signal um, to other neurons with which they are connected and then uh, generate some kind of output. Uh, can be a perception, can be an image, um, anything. Uh, and uh, the ingenious idea was to say, well, if the brain, if this is approximately what the brain uh, does with um, visual input, other perceptual input, uh, couldn't we, couldn't we um, also simulate this um, in silico uh, in computer networks? Um, uh, 
And so the very first sort of primitive um, um, idea was to say, okay, we've got a couple of neurons here as an input layer, uh, and then you have um, uh, layers in between, hidden layers, um, and then an output layer. And the sophistication of what the network can do uh, is basically determined by uh, the connectivity between all the nodes, but also uh, the number of layers uh, within such a network. And um, initially, there were uh, quite uh, substantial computational limits um, to the way in which these networks could be uh, computed. So processing power uh, was just not sufficient um, uh, all the way to the sort of 80s, um, 90s, and even 2000s to really do sophisticated and interesting uh, things with these algorithms. So the basic idea uh, has now around, it's been around for decades, but we could really only meaningfully deploy uh, these networks for applications such as um, image recognition, pattern recognition, computer vision, as it's generally called, uh, once we were able to build more sophisticated um, uh, architectures, more layers, um, more networks. Um, and this has given rise to the sort of deep learning revolution uh, in the last couple of years, where um, one a very good example, I think, is that in computer science, you have these um, so-called you know, competitions in which you would sort of, for, for example, give a set of images uh, to algorithms and the, the task for the algorithm is to do a classification or pattern recognition. And ImageNet was, was one, uh, a very, one la very large collection of curated, annotated um, images. Let's say, for example, for breeds of dogs or other sort of um, groups um, of images. And you can see here that e even in the 2010s, so it's more like 10 years ago, the traditional approaches to machine learning had still an, an error rate of, of about 30, 25 percent. And then once the first um, uh, deep learning networks came around, uh, which had sort of eight intermediate layers, so were uh, more sophisticated than the early networks, but much less sophisticated than the ones that we that we have today. Even the introduction of these first uh, uh, generation of new uh, uh, artificial neural networks already half the error rate uh, in these comp basically blowing away the competition. And you can see here that in the subsequent years with um, increased sophistication of the networks, with here the ResNet architecture, for example, having 152 layers in between, uh, it basically the comp competition uh, became obsolete because the uh, network became so good at uh, pattern recognition, image classification, uh, that you know that they had to find new challenges. And um, this is also reflected uh, by the uh, by the fact that these um, architectures have now become very good um, at solving uh, sophisticated um, games like Go, for example, AlphaGo, it's a very good example. And the most impressive aspect um, of this uh, development, in my view, was that okay, here you had here you had a game, the Asian board game of Go, which has a much higher um, uh, much higher complexity than, than chess, just in sheer uh, uh, number of possible moves, dimensionality, if you will, um, um, of, the, of, uh, of the game as a system. And then along came AlphaGo, and uh, what they did there was basically um, have uh, the algorithm um, uh, play against uh, uh, itself based on uh, uh, annotated um, data first, uh, but then uh, in the second iteration, when they had AlphaGo Zero, which was sort of the next generation of this algorithm, first generation was beating the best human Go player in this in this publicized um, tournament, 4 to 1. Uh, and so people were stunned because um, many experts predicted that this was, uh, you know, many years away from happening and then it happened. Um, but the real breakthrough, in my view, was that the, the next iteration, the AlphaGo Zero um, architecture, was only given uh, the rules and basically played, you know, what are, what are the 20, 30 million times against itself um, to become better um, at the game and then blew away the original architecture, the AlphaGo, that beat the best human player by 100 to 0 gains. Um, so basically, like completely obliterating uh, uh, this uh, this competition. Um, and this uh, and so in very very well defined environments like games, um, these algorithms work very well in data rich environments, in situations in which we have a lot of annotated um, data in which we 
uh, in which a lot of human knowledge and experience in some way um, also enters uh, the training process um, of these networks. Uh, but they increasingly also become very good at um, exploring um, new questions and, uh, and environments uh, on which they've not been um, uh, trained on human knowledge um, before, like in open world games um, now and other situations. Uh, but it also still has uh, some, some limitations. So the strengths are that they have superior performances in many tasks, that they excel at what computer scientists call end-to-end learning so you can go all the way from the for example in brain computer interfaces you can go all the way from the raw data um, of from the brain like eg data uh, to analysis all the way to visualization or some kind of uh, interaction uh, it's also pretty good much better than previous machine learning approaches on something's called transfer learning so uh, if you train a um, network in one particular environment uh, and then they transfer it to an environment that is slightly different, um, previous machine learning uh, approaches often abysmally um, failed, uh, even though you only made slight adjustments um, uh, in the task. But it turns out that the artificial neural networks, um, uh, they reach some kind of um, base level of, um, of experience or, or competence that even if you change uh, some of the uh, uh, task parameters, they uh, will start off um, better than you would actually uh, than you would actually expect, um, or uh, or than the previous uh, generation of algorithms uh, did. And something that's extremely important, obviously, for uh, uh, for using um, deep neuro deep learning in various environments, is that they can be deployed in in real time applications. So if you want to have uh, a self-driving car that uses uh, these kinds of um, approaches, if you want to have real-time brain-computer interfaces, what you need is the uh, ability to use it in real-time, not with uh, you know, a couple of seconds uh, or even minutes of lag. You have to have real-time interaction, and we now have the computing abilities, the processing power to do this. Um, but it also has limitations because many um, parameters, design choices of the way in which the network um, is designed uh, it often happens without a primary knowledge which uh, configuration, which architecture of the network is best. So basically, um, it still involves a lot of um, software engineering, a lot, lot of tinkering, a lot of human um, experimentation that goes into understanding what the best uh, network architecture is. And this leads to relatively slow training because you have to try out um, various different designs and parameters. Um, and therefore, one of the major frontiers of computer science uh, research in that domain is now the whole idea of meta-learning and um, auto-machine learning in that you basically use neural networks to train um, uh, other neural networks or to understand what the best um, uh, parameters, best design choices, best architectures are, uh, so networks that, that train uh, themselves. And obviously um, in the mm, sort of domain of uh, human AI interaction, something that is uh, concerning a lot of um, people all the way to policymakers and regulators who have to make decisions about how we use these systems. Uh, one uh, nagging problem is the problem of uh, interpretability and also to some degree uh, explainability and understandability uh, of deep neural networks and the black box aspect of AI. And I'm going to talk a little bit, bit about that uh, later on um, as well. Uh, but one thing I wanted to point out because, okay, we said, yeah, well, uh, the artificial neural networks were somehow loosely inspired by, by our uh, increased understanding of, of how the brain um, is wired in the, in the you know, uh, beginning of 20th century, uh, 1950s and so forth. Uh, but um, for, for a long time, uh, people thought, well, this is uh, more or less just uh, a loose metaphor. Uh, in actuality, uh, the artificial neural networks are still doing something fundamentally different uh, from what the brain does. Uh, but it turns out now that um, uh, if you use uh, principles uh, from neuroscience in terms of wiring uh, and reinforcement learning, other uh, um, mechanisms that have been uncovered uh, in, in our understanding of neural circuitry, for example, and if you use those to um, uh, to change sort of uh, the architecture of, of deep neural networks, it turns out that uh, 
uh, there is actually perhaps a deeper connection between uh, between wiring and information processing in the human brain and information processing uh, in deep neural networks. So there's this whole field of neuroscience inspired um, AI. Also the, uh, the, the idea that we can now perhaps even build new kinds of computer uh, chips, uh, whole area of neuromorphic computing in which the general idea is to say, well, um, what if we uh, design the chip in such a way that it looks uh, like a biological uh, neural network and works uh, like a biological neural network? Could we have uh, energy uh, gains, efficiency gains and computational gains? And it turns out that this seems to be the case. So the first uh, generation of neuromorphic uh, computing chips uh, factor thousand more energy efficient than traditional computing architecture specifically for uh, for uh, deep learning applications. Um, so a lot of excitement in sort of the convergence uh, of uh, ideas from neuroscience uh, and AI. Uh, and one area in which this is um, also being used, this is an example from a working group here in Freiburg where, uh, where I worked before, is that you can now use uh, these kinds of neural networks also for uh, for data analysis in neuroscience. Uh, so EEG, for example, electroencephalography is an interesting biosignal. It's what you measure uh, from outside of the skull with electrodes. You can measure the bioelectric um, activity of the brain. You can do this also from inside uh, the skull, directly from the brain surface, different electrode systems. And uh, the uh, nice idea here is to say, well, if these um, algorithms are really good at uh, image classification and image recognition, what if we treated um, signals uh, that, you know, that have very interesting properties in the time domain and in the frequency domain? Uh, what if we treated them uh, like uh, images as well, applied um, sliding window, a high sampling frequency in which you would look at the signal, um, uh, the high sampling rate, but basically treated it like a, uh, like a succession um, of images. And if you do that and use convolutional neural networks, you can, uh, you can gain uh, very nice insights uh, and use this for, uh, for real-time applications in neuroscience. So one, one example uh, here is a BCI setup, um, brain-computer interface setup in which you have um, EEG system here, uh, a graphical user interface computer here, uh, and uh, showing that you can use deep learning algorithms um, to operate an um, autonomous um, robot here. And perhaps I'm gonna, um, oops, oh, no, uh, yeah, this is not the video. Um, yeah, so the future convergence uh, here will be in the area of uh, neuromorphic uh, computing. This is an example of the Intel Doihi chip where you can see that the, uh, the chip architecture is fundamentally different from what you would have in a traditional uh, 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 CPU or graphics processing unit. Um, but uh, of course, these uh, new generation of AI-based neurotechnologies uh, come also with uh, major challenges because obviously um, uh, uh, generating a lot of um, brain data or processing uh, personal data, sensor data uh, from uh, robotics um, requires uh, a lot of attention uh, for security and so informational security and informational privacy um, because ultimately um, you know any kind of device whether it be a robot or a medical device or an implant um, uh, has a vulnerability in terms of be, being uh, hacked so this is an example of implantable uh, pacemakers even way back in 2008 that used um, wireless signal transfer and with basic equipment from electronic shops you know people are already um, able to access these devices and deliver command shocks so um, since uh, because of the sensorization of our environment now and that most information transfer happens wirelessly uh, via um, wi-fi or bluetooth or nfc and other means uh, we need to we need to ensure that uh, uh, signals that travel um, between devices, uh, sensors, and humans um, actually obviously secured uh, from unwarranted access. Um, uh, but the problem also uh, lies with data governance and data um, processing. So, if you had, for example, some kind of consumer neurotechnology uh, from any of the big technology companies that are working on this um, right now. And everyone would sort of send their brain data into centralized uh, cloud-based processing. Uh, these companies, 
would obviously make this uh, setup very vulnerable uh, in terms of data security, um, but also in the perhaps the privacy um, of, um, of these data from the individuals. And so there's a lot of effort now in developing decentralized uh, data processing architectures uh, using um, approaches like federated learning, in which sort of the intelligence, the, the AI, uh, the learning basically happens on the device only and what is shared um, centrally with the central data processor uh, are only the features that are extracted from these um, from these raw data and the raw data never leaves uh, the person and never leaves the device. Um, uh, so that uh, that could be an approach. The other approaches are differential privacy, uh, monomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, so software hardware-based methods uh, for securing these data from unwarranted um, access. Um, but another challenge that I alluded to uh, earlier uh, is this problem of interpretability and explainability. Um, here's this nice cartoon, what, it, what does it say? Let's never forget that the public's desire for transparency has to be balanced by our need for concealment, says the CEO of this, uh, of this cartoonish um, company, but it's obviously a real problem. Um, and the background is, or the basic uh, problem is that if you take different kinds of machine learning approaches, like, you know, obviously linear regression be something that has uh, that is understood very well, where you have a high degree of interpretability, so that you understand what the algorithm is doing and why uh, why the result uh, has come about. But in deep neural nets, um, neural networks, um, the internal learning dynamics, uh, feature selection, um, the, um, how the uh, network generates the output uh, uh, that it does, be it for pattern recognition or for prediction or for whatever, whatever it does, um, it's much more accurate uh, in many tasks than uh, these other approaches, but uh, what is suffering is uh, interpretability, our, under our ability to understand uh, what is actually going on um, in these networks. And so in uh, closed human machine setups like, say, intelligent closed loop uh, BCIs, the problems uh, is often, you know, so a closed loop BCI would be something where you use brain activity, for example, to operate this uh, robot, maybe based on deep learning, and then the robot gives some uh, some feedback, visual or even haptic, or even uh, for, for interactive um, brain stimulation. And so people now worry about this black box aspect that we don't understand how the robot works, we don't understand um, how the AI works. Um, but from a neuroscience perspective, the brain is pretty much also a black box because we do not fundamentally often do not understand how um, cognitive processes um, work. Um, we could go into the sort of how this relates to the sort of problem of multi-scale representation um, of cognitive processes. So the difficulty to understand um, how what's going on in, in single neurons or in ensemble of neurons in local regions of the brain um, and uh, in large scale networks in the brain uh, relates to uh, various cognitive processes like speech, language, thought, uh, emotion and so forth. So the basic problem that we, we cannot observe um, activity at all these different levels of observation at the same time and therefore don't have a full and complete understanding um, of what's going on uh, in the brain in relation to all these uh, processes. So two black boxes in close interaction might present a fundamental problem. Uh, because ultimately, it, uh, depending on the context, this might be more or less uh, uh, problematic because if you imagine you had here a consumer brain computer interface that you use for gaming or for ent entertainment in virtual reality or art, uh, for example, we might not care so much about the interpretability problem and might not be such a big deal. Um, but um, if we use the same system system for performance monitoring in uh, for pilots or for PCI control for uh, in wheelchairs, for example, transparency, interpretability, explainability is a big issue uh, because it might become a regulatory requirement, for example, for medical devices or for robots. Um, and this leads to some degree also to the sort of more philosophically minded or legally minded problem of uh, accountability or responsibility. Uh, in human uh, AI interaction or close human, uh, hybrid human uh, AI, human robot co-actions. So uh, obviously we, we cannot, you know, here if you have this fictitious um, killer robot would make no sense uh, to actually put the, uh, uh, the robot 
uh, to court and on trial uh, because uh, uh, in close human AI interactions, uh, you have increasingly close um, hybrid um, systems in which maybe human and an intelligent system interact in a certain way or co-act in a certain way. And you could have the situation, so imagine someone uh, who's paralyzed, who's operating a robotic arm uh, with, their, with their brain activity, and then the agency of the person might, uh, might diminish because more uh, decision-making capacity, more action capacity is transferred uh, to the algorithmic system, to the, to the robotic arm. So you get these strange situations of shared agency, hybrid agency, uh, human-machine co-actions. And then we can say, okay, we understand that the system is now uh, making decisions or taking on uh, taking on actions. Uh, but what we don't understand is what happens with accountability, responsibility, if it diminishes uh, in the human. Like, uh, where is this accountability going? Can intelligent systems, can robots, can AIs actually be held accountable or responsible uh, for certain actions? Um, um, and uh, the fundamental underlying problem is the problem of sort of moral agency. So, in the space of uh, in relation to uh, to robots, this has been um, described to say that rather than taking a dichotomous view in which you would say either you have full moral agency, so you're like the human who can make informed decisions um, based on based on evidence or intuition or other mechanisms. Um, or you're, uh, you don't have moral agency at all, it's obviously the, the reality is much more graded um, in which you would have um, also something like functional um, morality in which um, uh, a human, for example, could behave as if uh, it had full moral consciousness, so would understand um, uh, the reasons uh, and consequences of their behavior and had introspective um, ability and the ability to explain um, their behavior. Um, but in reality, um, uh, nothing is going on, even though the person behaves, behaves in that way. And so the closest equivalent in humans would be something like psychopathy uh, in the act in the sort of um, sense and that, and that forensic psychiatrists uh, use it, in which you have um, people who might be, still have the capacity to act as if they had a moral conscience, but in reality had no, had no moral conscience at all. And then you could have operational uh, morality uh, in, in robots. Uh, that would mean that you can program certain desirable behaviors um, into the system that it can act, again, uh, conforming to certain moral standards um, or rules. Um, uh, so it's a top-down approach to, uh, to moral decision-making, but it could never um, have anything like moral learning or, it, or um, uh, display the full range and complicated range um, of human um, moral uh, consciousness and moral decision-making. Um, and obviously, the ethical sens sensitivity would uh, uh, would also depend on on what level of morality such a system could uh, could achieve. And most experts would agree that uh, any AI system now, any robot system now, uh, does not have full moral agency in the sense that we ascribe it to humans, because it does not have um, consciousness, no phenomenal consciousness, um, and so this will remain a problem uh, for quite a long time. But uh, on the other hand, um, robots are becoming an uh, uh, important reality uh, in our lives. And people tell us uh, that we need to learn better learn how to love uh, our robots. But I think this GIF um, quite nicely illustrates the situation in which we find ourselves um, now, in which uh, we are confronted with um, certain types of uh, systems, like a robot or a smartphone. Uh, and we're basically forced to interact with these systems um, in the way that the systems uh, demand and, and uh, want from us, uh, rather than the other way around. Um, and so one way to look at human technology interaction uh, from sort of cognitive science, uh, neuroscience perspective, uh, would to say uh, would be this uh, 4E framework um, of cognition in which, uh, you know, we'd say uh, cognition cannot be, um, cannot be uh, viewed in isolation, so you cannot look at uh, uh, decisions um, or analysis or what's going on 
uh, in the brain uh, without taking also the, also the perspective of embodiment to say that, okay, our perceptions, um, our actions, uh, our interaction with the world are highly influenced, heavily influenced by, by the fact that we have, uh, that we have physical bodies. Um, also nice, uh, uh, illustration, nicely illustrated in the sort of German difference between Körper and Leib, so the physical body, uh, the Körper, uh, and the sort of uh, soulful uh, body, uh, the Leib. Um, uh, and this uh, body uh, is obviously embedded in a complex uh, environment and has to interact with, these, uh, with this environment. And the idea of extended cognition obviously is that we can uh, use devices to augment uh, or assist uh, our cognitive abilities. So a notepad uh, is an extended uh, is a tool for extended cognition because you can note down memories and help uh, uh, help your own um, memory. Um, but also a, a cane, a walking stick uh, for blind people is an extension um, of their body, an extension of their perceptual abilities. And then there's the idea of uh, an activism. I'm going to talk about uh, this a little bit. And so if we look at robots, if we look at AI systems and we ask um, uh, uh, how alike are they actually to humans? How or what cap capabilities do they have? This might be a, a good framework, framework because purely in terms of embodiment, uh, you can see here a typical sort of human-like anthropomorphic um, robot um, that looks uh, a bit, that has a body plan, uh, more or less like a human has, with limbs uh, and a head and a torso. Uh, and therefore, you might think, oh, this is actually an, an embodied robot. Uh, but on the other hand, the future, but uh, in, in actual fact, this is a very rigid system that has no sophisticated uh, perceptual um, abilities and no haptics uh, uh, to speak of. And so the future will not be, you know, in terms of uh, capabilities and embodiment, the future will not be much more interesting uh, in terms of soft robotics, where you have soft materials that can have very finely tuned um, haptic capabilities, perceptual capabilities. Um, and you can show a short video here on uh, what this means for so human robot uh, interactions you see. Uh, a person here that has um, an intracortical uh, implant for microstimulation of the of the part of the brain that is uh, that is responsible for uh, uh, for sensations, some of the sensory sensations. Um, I'm good. So you see the robot arm here, and this is connected uh, to the person's brain through this implant, and he touches Index. the robot uh, finger. Person Brain. does not see what he's doing. Pinky. Index. Middle. 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 Ring. Ring. Index. Index. Ring. So I think this is um, quite impressive because it shows how uh, how well we can now co uh, connect um, things like robotic systems to um, some of the topically organized uh, sensory um, systems um, in the brain. Uh, and in terms of embeddedness, the question would be how can we um, integrate robots and other um, artificial systems in such a way that they can become um, um, sort of natural part um, of the environment and are not threatening or, um, or in, other, in any other way unpleasant uh, to humans. This is a, a huge challenge, obviously, in the, in the area of healthcare, where social robots are increasingly used for rehabilitation, in the whole area of care uh, for the elderly, in which uh, care robots will play a significant role in the future. And this um, uh, uh, next aspect um, of extended cognition is the question of can we leverage, um, for example, brain-computer interface technology, but also our interactions um, with robots um, to extend certain uh, cognitive or social cognitive skills. A lot of research going on in that domain. Um, and in terms of inactivism, uh, the basic idea of inactivism is to say that you can have perceptually guided um, action. So um, for a learning, adaptive learning uh, robot, 
rather than sort of just reacting in a pre-programmed way uh, with the environment, if you give the robot sophisticated uh, perceptual abilities, it can learn much better uh, to interact uh, in the, with the environment to enact, um, uh, to be an active because it can uh, guide its own action um, by, by perceptual input, which would be a huge um, advance in, in interactive robotics. Um, and then in terms of as a prerequisite for trust, uh, the question now becomes, how should we actually design uh, these robotic systems? And there are very different um, philosophies in that space. Um, you can see here that uh, this person in Japan, Hiroshi Shiguro, is a well-known robotics researcher uh, who's building these very uncanny, um, almost um, perfect copies uh, of himself, um, which uh, freak a lot of people out. Uh, whereas in, in other um, uh, domains, um, so we have colleagues from the University of Siegen who are, who are uh, developing these household robots and their design philosophy is to say that uh, the design of a robotic system should actually match the capabilities um, of, the, of the system in terms of its interactivity, in terms of its social capabilities. So a system that, uh, that is uh, only used as a service robot for showing certain content or bringing you a cup of tea uh, should be designed to be immediately recognizable as a tool or, a, or an appliance. And so it makes no sense um, because um, anything that has a very uh, a strong anthropomorphic design can induce um, uh, can induce the illusion um, of social interactivity uh, in such a way uh, that people will ascribe uh, a robot that moves like a human, that looks like a human, automatically we ascribe these systems as uh, social capabilities that the systems often cannot fulfill. And this can lead to all kinds of, uh, of failed human-robot interactions and will also be a, a big problem in terms of building uh, trust between uh, between uh, uh, robots um, and humans. And you can see here, okay, uh, uh, can they ever become social others, partners, or friends? And you can you know have a lot of different estimates of what the developmental trajectory of social robotics will be. But I would agree that at the moment they are merely merely helpers and concierges. Um, and pe but people want to have uh, social robots that act more like friends, teammates, um, or coaches. Uh, uh, but in this space, so um, uh, you do not have to trust um, your washing machine, you do not trust your car, but you rely on technical um, appliances that surround your uh, environment to work well and to perform the tasks that they're designed to perform. Um, but the more interactive um, these systems become, the question of trust uh, may become a real issue. And we wrote uh, a little bit about this in the space of uh, social robots for rehabilitation and said that, of course, safety is an important uh, prerequisite, but also the, uh, the notion of being able to generate shared goals, uh, even intentions, which is problematic, of course, of course philosophically. Um, the, uh, the, question of predictability, but also the ability for mutual attunement in terms of being able to interpret human emotions uh, and human behavior. Um, and because there will be in the future very complicated new forms of interactions between patients, healthcare providers and robots that all influence the question of, um, of how we configure uh, these kinds of relationships. Um, and I would also say that I myself am a little bit skeptical whether trust is actually really the best way uh, um, to describe this, because you could say, um, well, trust uh, is so, so much influenced by psychological factors and trust, um, uh, sort of the other side of trust is that trust can be betrayed, uh, that, uh, you know, that there's also uh, mistrust. Um, uh, and so uh, a robot that can never uh, betray you uh, could you really trust this system? It's something that we could perhaps um, discuss in the Q&A. So the whole psychological level is sort of missing uh, in human uh, AI, human robotic interactions at the moment, because again, robots and AI systems don't have full consciousness, don't have phenomenological experience, uh, and therefore cannot act uh, in the same way in that, in that respect as humans can. 
Um, and this can uh, become a problem in the way in which we design and deploy technology in society because uh, this framework of uh, sort of persuasive technologies um, says, okay, we can say these can be tools, but uh, technologies can also be a medium like VR, for example, is both a tool because you can use it for research, for example, but it's also a medium because it can show content, it can relate uh, information to you. But at the moment in which we, we understand these technologies as social actors and create relationships uh, by providing positive feedback uh, or modeling targeted uh, behavior or attitudes or providing social support, the, the interactions become much more complicated uh, because of the accountability gap, because of the lack of consciousness that these systems um, have. And that can lead to very complicated um, situations all the way to deceptive illusions, manipulations, um, and so forth. Because another important aspect is the aspect of vulnerability, because humans are vulnerable in, in, so, many, in so many ways. They can be vulnerable because of mental health issues, because of social injustice, uh, because of institutional uh, problems like prison populations are vulnerable by the fact uh, that they're in prison, for example. Uh, can be also dispositional by certain character traits that we have. Um, and so humans are vulnerable uh, in many ways and uh, robots and other systems that simulate uh, social capabilities that they actually don't have might exploit uh, these multi-dimensional vulnerabilities uh, in interactions. This is in the space of VR. We uh, wrote a little bit about uh, that th therefore we need a very close interaction between biomedical ethics and ideas from design thinking, uh, value-sensitive design, human-oriented design, uh, to build better systems um, in the future. And one way we're doing this in Freiburg is also by engaging in a lot of um, outreach activities. So we had this um, uh, program two years ago where street artists and scientists from the university created big um, murals and maybe reflecting uh, a little bit um, on this problem of mutual understanding and the, the black box aspect of human machine uh, interaction. Uh, we created this mural with fantastic um, artists uh, from Berlin. Um, and might close with a, a nice quote um, uh, by British philosopher Nora O'Neill in the context of talking about transparency uh, and information. Uh, she said that unlike in, pigeon, uh, in passenger pigeons, um, information does not automatically fly to the right audiences. So in human-machine interaction, the onus um, to build um, trust in this technology, uh, rather than building uh, systems that induce uh, trust without actually um, having the capabilities um, for maintaining trustful relationships. The onus is really on us to design the systems in such a way that they can be reliable, safe, uh, um, but also um, uh, meaningful to interact with. So I'd like to thank uh, all the collaborators, uh, my lab here at the University of Freiburg, uh, and obviously, um, again, the organizers for, for inviting me to this, um, to this event. Many thanks. Well, Philip, that was uh, that probably couldn't have been better if I had uh, given you <laughs> pointers as to what topics to touch upon. Thank you so very much. Um, also for keeping to time so nicely. If all our presenters uh, could be like that, we would be in uh, good shape. Thank you so much for starting off our program uh, in such a fantastic way. We have uh, questions coming in uh, in no particular order. We have a question uh, from Yogis Karpus uh, who says, uh, to what extent and detail do we need to specify objectives that AI-powered agents have to pursue? Is this another mm -hmm. limitation to the use of AI tools? Yeah, this is a, a, a very good question because um, in terms, as I said, in terms of the uh, capabilities, AI systems are very good now at um, um, performing tasks um, that we set for them. So uh, if we say sort these uh, images or find um, you know cats, find dogs uh, in a collection of images, they can do this very well. Um, but uh, what distinguishes us as human agents um, from artificial um, agents like AIs um, or robots is that we uh, we can generate our own goals. Um, so we can we can say you know I now want to uh, have a cup of coffee or want to you know travel to Italy whenever that's if this ever will be possible again in the future. So we can generate high-level, um, long-term 
uh, goals that are of course obviously tied to certain uh, intentions and there are sophisticated understandings in philosophy frameworks in philosophy now that you know distinguish different levels of intentions like proximal intentions where you know want something here and now which is very close but also very distal intentions in which you can make long-term plans in which you have commitments to certain causes and which you have certain conceptual frameworks under which you're operating and this is all um, these deeper levels of um, conceptualization of consciousness and goal directedness are currently lacking uh, in AI. But what we can do uh, is if we train this, as, so if we use um, a deep neural network without giving it any specific um, goals and just the instruction to find patterns in a pile of data, for example, it will still do that. But then the problem uh, arises that we might not understand um, the way in which the, the, the algorithms uh, un arranges um, the data. Uh, and so we are sort of bound uh, in this space in which we can say, okay, we can um, make AIs perform uh, certain tasks uh, better than we can in data rich environments. Uh, but if we unleash them and let them explore freely the parameter space um, um, out there, uh, they might come up with classifications that and, and recognition pattern, patterns that do not match our own pattern recognition abilities, our own cognitive um, frameworks and, and abilities. And so that, that would lead to a fundamental problem of understanding each other. So my favorite example, if I may just shortly maybe, is uh, that MRI scanners, for example, can resolve sort of up to 5,000 shades of gray, like uh, in the raw data and the raw machine data um, of, the F, of the MRI scan, uh, but the data is heavily downsampled because the human perceptual system can only distinguish like 30 or 50 shades of gray, hence perhaps the book or not, I don't know. Uh, so 50 shades of gray, uh, experts can do a little bit more uh, and all of radiology, all of clinical radiology, all of neuroscience um, basically uh, in this space is based on this of our perceptual ability to distinguish these different shades of gray. But imagine you let an artificial neural network loose on the machine level data of an MRI machine and say, find patterns that are characteristic or predictive for certain kinds of states or for certain you know, long-term issues like, will this person develop uh, dementia in 10 years, um, you know, predictive um, algorithms. And then it turned out the algorithm is very good at doing that. So the prediction is very good. Or the, uh, uh, yeah, some performance very good, but we cannot understand it. Like we cannot, um, because we lack the perceptual ability um, to uh, to resolve it um, at this level of granularity. And this would create, of course, a huge sort of epistemic gap between AI systems, between artificial systems and humans, uh, and which would again pose the question of like, can we trust this system? Uh, uh, is performance, uh, fidelity in performance alone a good characteristic or do we actually need an understanding of how the system comes to its uh, output, comes to its conclusion? It's be a fundamental problem. In human we'll have to update our learning to, to understand uh, to understand the new, uh, new ways yeah. of uh, processing the data. We have a follow-up question, which I think you touched upon uh, in, in a slide that, that came after the question popped up. But the question was, should autonomous artificial agents always be unconditionally benevolent towards humans, even if this makes us, example, lazy or exploitative? And I think you, you touched on this a little bit, maybe you yeah. want to go into it a little bit. Yeah, this goes a little bit into the sort of problem of moral machines or like, um, can you actually use a top-down approach for programming rules uh, and not, you know, three laws of robotics or whatever, uh, like, uh, you know, have some kind of uh, overriding general rule that will lead to sort of um, safe and ben benevolent uh, behavior under all circumstances. And, uh, but the problem will be, of course, that um, um, human interactions and environments are extremely complex and you will um, eventually find situations uh, in which this pre-programmed behavior can have a, a, the exact opposite effect because it might put certain uh, 
that might protect one uh, group of people and put, uh, put other people um, at harm. So any kind of top-down pre-programmed uh, rule like a do not kill, that's a very fundamental uh, human rule that we all uh, try to live by uh, and follow in, uh, in our everyday life, uh, I hope. Uh, you can easily construe circumstances and situations in which this fundamental rule just does not hold. Um, true uh, and therefore I'd be very skeptical um, whether these uh, you know any set of sort of um, general um, norms or moral rules will will lead to um, reliable uh, safe and effective uh, human robot behavior but rather like morality in humans uh, is uh, is a developmental process and so I'd, I'd rather take the, the view from uh, from developmental psychology to say that humans come to the world uh, with the ability um, to learn um, um, rules and norms uh, from their environment. And then you have, you know, in the first couple of years, it's obviously the parents that closely interact with the child and children learn by imitating um, um, their parents. And, but then eventually um, they grow um, sort of moral consciousness, if you will. They understand rules and why they're important. And then they interact with their peers and they try out these rules in very... Uh, uh, playful, uh, sophisticated interactions um, uh, on the schoolyard uh, with their siblings and so forth. So, and this is quite a long period actually in which you are sort of protected uh, in, in the parental environment, but, as to, in, but you can still play around with these rules. It's basically what my children do all the time, <laughs> like testing the boundaries um, of these rules and see whether they actually hold um, uh, or whether they, they are flexible. And so if we, if we had systems um, that could learn from the environment, the explicit and implicit rules, uh, they would, I think, be much more robust in terms of moral behavior, in terms of adequate behavior with humans uh, than uh, if, we, if we only use the top-down approach. Fantastic. We have uh, some follow-up questions, if you'd still uh, feel up for it. We have somebody asking, um, while the technical uh, or technological development surely pursues making AI systems more capable, uh, do you think we should draw a line where technical development should stop, uh, given some of the ethical concerns you raise, like transparency? Yeah, it's always difficult to say uh, we need uh, red lines uh, because on, um, human societies um, thrive on innovation. Um, and and uh, in many ways, like so here in Freiburg, we have a long tradition of, uh, sort of philosophical anthropology, phenomenology. And in that perspective, you know, the hardcore positions are to say you cannot think humans outside of technology. So all our history, all our interaction with the world is in, to some degree based on, on technology, fire, everything. And the hardcore philosophical anthropologists will say that even your teeth and your digestive system are a kind of technology because you transform things uh, and make use, um, make use of the environment. Uh, and so you, humans have a propensity uh, to innovate, uh, to develop uh, technology, and every sophisticated and complex technology has dual use aspects. Um, uh, same is true for AI, for neurotechnology, for BCIs. And so I think uh, the space where you would really need to have um, good governance and good rules uh, is a sort of the military domain, because um, that's a big concern, obviously, autonomous weapon systems, um, robots that have offensive capabilities uh, and so forth. That is one space and domain where you need clear international guidelines, rules, uh, soft law uh, and uh, legal norms and so forth. And the other is sort of the whole area of consumer protection and consumer technology, because there you often have um, fraudulent uh, or you know technology that is driven by marketing claims um, uh, rather than sort of uh, um, having our best interests, our well-being, our flourishing in mind. And so, in these two spaces, I would say we have to put uh, uh, good rules uh, in effect to make sure that the uh, technology does not overwhelm us or has an overall negative effect on societies, but we, know, we still need a lot of freedom uh, for research and innovation. I think what you, you basically highlighted throughout your talk is context is key. And uh, I think that if we determine, you know, in, in which context on that lovely uh, uh, spectrum you, you, you set out, I think we, we get a sense of that's, that's how you determine to what degree things need to be regulated. We do have some more questions popping in. I'm sorry, you're, you're very popular. Uh, we have another question saying, we often consciously decide uh, 
and choose how to explain our own actions to others. Being a bit of a black box in this sense is sometimes useful. Are we requiring too much from AI? And I, and I think you, you sort of, I think you hinted at the fact that, yeah, we, you know, when, when we interact with other individuals, uh, um, human agents, yeah, we don't yeah. necessarily expect to, to understand exactly how they came to, yeah. to the conclusions that they came to. It's a very good uh, point. Uh, thanks very much um, for the question. This is something we're actually discussing with our legal colleagues in the interdisciplinary research program here a lot because they they often say, look, we do most people do not understand the, the technical systems that they interact with to any in any to any degree of sophistication. So the average car, not not even self driving car, just the average car that is rolling out of the factory uh, nowadays has 100 million lines of code, 100 million lines of code uh, for the average car. Um, and so people, most people don't understand how, how, how their car works, how their dishwasher works, how their washing machine works, but we still, uh, but we have a, a good framework um, of regulations and safety um, measures in place to make sure that we can interact safely, more or less safely um, with these systems. And so they say we should perhaps not demand too much from, from AI systems in, in, in the way in which they should explain themselves. Like we do not expect our dishwasher to explain uh, itself or our car to explain itself. But it becomes, of course, more difficult if these systems can act more autonomously, if they can explore the environment, self-driving cars, um, uh, autonomous robots, um, obvious uh, example. And this harks back a little bit to the problem of, of interpretability because you can have a system that is to some degree interpretable for an expert, for a machine learning expert, for a computer scientist, but is still not uh, understandable uh, uh, or, or even difficult to translate um, this machine level understanding of what's going on to sort of commonly understandable um, ways of of talking about these things. And this may make it very difficult for lawmakers because ultimately a judge also has to understand um, whether okay. there was uh, the, the, the inherent risks and the capabilities um, and what's possible there. So an analogy that I found quite nice in, in recent, um, that I was thinking about was in fundamental physics, uh, for example, you have something like general relativity, and that's uh, at the mathematical level an extremely difficult uh, set uh, of differential nonlinear equations that even at the time and perhaps even now very few people can penetrate and understand to the last um, to the last degree. Uh, and the genius of Einstein, for example, was to say we have this very difficult set. Uh, of nonlinear uh, equations, but I can unpack it in such a way that I can tell you about it in metaphors um, and talking about moving trains and observers uh, and time in such a way that it's understandable, uh, immediately understandable for everybody uh, uh, what general relativity is and what, what it does. And so maybe we need um, ways uh, to sort of connect this machine level understanding of what's going on more or less uh, uh, to useful narratives and metaphors that preserve the essence of what's going on, but also make it relatable and un understandable uh, for everybody to be able to, to actually build uh, trustworthy relations with these systems. There was so much in there and I wanted to ask you about soft robotics. There are two more questions that have popped up into the live stream chat. Uh, our next speaker is uh, already waiting in the wings because you guys are all amazing and on time. Um, but uh, yeah, Philip, thank you so much for all your fantastic input today. Um, I wanted to ask you more, as I said, about soft touch because I work in, in effective touch in humans and we use that yeah. as a bridge to, in fact, between one another at the beginning and an end of conversations, sort of like a negotiation uh, protocol to say, yes, I'm, initi I'm ready to initiate with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so soft touch becomes so fantastically interesting as a, as a new frontier for me, but we'll have to pick up maybe in Gathertown, which we've uh, set up for our coffee breaks. Uh, details, right. I'll give some more of that uh, later today. But because we have Katsumi Watanabe in our waiting um, room, I'd like to thank you one more time, Philip, and ask you if you wouldn't mind to pop over to the live stream chat, uh, where there are a couple more questions waiting for you. Yeah, uh, how, you how, do I, how do I do this? Um, uh, if you simply go to, I'll to pop YouTube, in the chat. Uh, channel. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but if you go, I'll, I'll pop it in the chat and then where you just click yes. the link. So, uh, um, but, 
And thanks again for, for all the fantastic questions from the audience. Thank you, Mada, for the invitation and congratulations on the fantastic program. It's really Thank nice. you so, so very, very much, Philip. We, we